So uh, everybody here and of course all of our members will be able to view this presentation uh, a little later and we'll send that out to everyone after uh, the presentation tonight or tomorrow. Um, my name is Caitlin Fellow. I'm the Association Director of Seneca Pure Waters and I have the pleasure of, we have the pleasure of hosting tonight's um, presentation uh, with Brian Ashenauer. Brian is a senior extension associate from New York State Integrated Pest Management uh, through Cornell. And Brian, Brian's current work with New York Integrated Pest Management emphasizes the detection and management of invasive pests to protect New York's agricultural, landscaped, and natural environments. His leadership on the invasive spotted lanternfly in New York State has brought national recognition to the Integrated Pest Management Program. And with a background in plant diagnostics, his work centers on insect and plant disease identification and management. Brian also delivers extension programming, like tonight's presentation, and conducts applied research where he works to bring sustainable pest management innovations to New York agriculture producers and residents. So I welcome Brian. Brian, thank you very much for this presentation tonight. Uh, it's very timely for our membership and volunteers as we're uh, gearing up to promote the work with uh, Finger Lakes Prism's um, spotted lanternfly work uh, through the uh, monitoring program that they run. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Caitlin. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this um, insect that could be important for our region. And yeah, I'm going to uh, show some of the work that they're doing at the Finger Lakes uh, Prism uh, group at, in my slides. And so let me share so I can uh, get started here. I've got a presentation and let's see. Just while Brian's pulling that up, I just want to say one more thing that before uh, you all joined tonight, Brian and I did discuss chat options in a Q&A. Um, you're welcome to use the chat box for the Q&A, and we might be taking questions throughout the presentation. So if something on Brian's slides uh, strikes you and you have a question immediately, feel free to use the chat, and I will then, um, I'll, I'll be following that and we'll share the, the questions with Brian. Thanks. Great. And does that look good, Caitlin? Looks great. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, yeah, I have been working with um, this insect since um, oh, 2018, and uh, we have concern about it, especially in our area, New York State, with uh, the importance of our wine industry, and this insect happens to like that, but it also can be an issue for um, residents as well. So let's, let's talk about this uh, insect and uh, what we might expect. So it is an invasive plant hopper, and that's important because of the way it feeds. You know, it's called spotted lantern fly, uh, but it's not a fly. And, you know, this picture that I took makes it look like a moth a little bit, but it is a plant hopper. And that's uh, important, as I mentioned, because of the way it feeds. It, is, it has a piercing and sucking mouth part, so it will never chew a leaf, but it taps into the the pipework of the tree or the leaflet that it's on and sucks sap, basically. It is native to Asia, and we're going to take a look at some maps here in a second. Um, it feeds on over 100 different plants in the United States, so it is pretty opportunistic. Whatever it might come along, except um, a conifers, we're not going to see it on pines and spruces. Um, and we keep finding new plants that it feeds upon. So uh, if I gave this presentation a year ago, we might have had 50 or 100 in that, but we're learning more about this as we go along. It definitely has a preferred host, and that is the tree of heaven. And I'm going to show you some pictures of that if you're not familiar with that tree. It is throughout the Finger Lakes, and you have certainly seen it. You've driven by some but you may not have recognized it. It also likes black walnuts, willows that we have here, red maples, and then I've underlined grapes because while at the end of the season, it really likes to go to grapevines and then it can cause some damage. We'll talk about that too. But here is that favorite tree that is um, 
located where this insect is located. I mean, that's the native range for this. So in New York State and North America, really, this tree is considered an invasive uh, species. But uh, the tree of heaven uh, can be distinguished by these long uh, leaves with all these leaflets on it. That's a yardstick there in the upper left hand corner below mm -hmm. the leaf. Um, so they can be very long with all these leaflets. And these circles here are at the base of the uh, leaflets. And those lobes are distinct. So you won't see those on black walnut. You won't see those on shumac. Um, if you see that, it is a tree of heaven. Also, if you're familiar with this tree, you know it has a distinct odor. If you crush the leaves or you break a stem, uh, some people say it smells like peanut butter or um, uh, something else, but it's a pretty strong odor. And uh, when the, uh, the spider lanternfly has access to this tree, it's just much more productive. It has seven lays seven times the number of eggs, and it lays the eggs earlier. And we're going to talk about that. It doesn't start laying its eggs until the end of September. So if that can be pushed off by not having this tree around, then we might have a frost that would kill the insect. So, um, well, let's go and take a look at where this insect is from. So it is native to Asia. You can see there in blue. That's its native range. And um, it has been introduced to, um, to North America there, starting in Pennsylvania, just south of us here in New York State. And uh, it is also invasive in Korea. Uh, so they've been dealing with it for probably about 20 years now. So it's not native to there. And we've learned a little bit on the way they've dealt with it. And then I get calls and emails from parts of Europe. It's not there yet, but they're concerned about it. Of course, they grow grapes and have this tree as a weedy species there as well. But let's take a look closer to home here. Um, our program uh, maintains this map. Uh, this is the national map that's being used. And um, we, I, get information from Ohio, West Virginia, North Carolina, all these places that you see. And if the county is colored in blue, that means somewhere in that county, there is an infestation. So that means year round, we're gonna be able to see them. In the winter, it's just gonna be an egg mass, but they're there. Um, there are some really tiny blue dots there and uh, are purple dots. And those are indications that an individual insect has been found there. Most often that insect is dead, but that's important for us to keep track of because where a dead insect has been found, uh, it might be a pathway and it might be a place for us to look for the live insect. So just a little closer here with New York State and our region, you can see the Finger Lakes is pretty well clear here, although uh, Tompkins County has um, an infestation and uh, Tioga uh, does as well, um, it, but it's really small, fortunately, in Tioga, or, or in Tompkins County. It is near the Cornell campus, um, and it's interesting, it first showed up at an apartment building, and if you looked at the license plates of the cars, many of them were from this region of uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, and it's possible that it could have been brought up um, and traveled in one of those vehicles, and then it set up shop there. And once it um, establishes it's, itself, it's very hard to eradicate. So that means to kill it completely. That has never happened successfully so far. Um, but I'll give our New York State Ag and Markets credit. They went in right after that infestation was found in uh, Ithaca, cut down a lot of trees and it's it is a very small population to this day and that's been uh, over two years ago um, the two most recent ones for new york state are syracuse and buffalo and um, those are right along uh, rail lines and uh, rail yards where uh, rail cars sit and so that's a possible way that it got there because if uh, it's laying eggs on rail cars in this area where there's a lot of spider lanternfly and they're in a new area in the spring, the eggs could hatch. 
Um, another view of this for New York, and this is a little bit more of like a heat map where, okay, we have a lot of spotted lanternfly in this area. And I get a lot of uh, contacts from the lower Hudson Valley and from the New York City area. Heard quite a few, uh, bit from them last year. And uh, all right, that's starting again from Staten Island, Brooklyn, that whole region. And uh, it's a little bit less up here. And we don't expect it at all in the Adirondacks. The growing season is going to be a little bit is too short for the insect to really survive up there. And there's some hope that even in the Finger Lakes region that it won't do as well as it's doing downstate because of our shorter growing season. Uh, and so as an organization, you may be familiar with the Finger Lakes PRISM and the PRISM stands for the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And this map shows where the traps are in the Finger Lakes. And I understand that you all uh, have the opportunity to help the Finger Lakes PRISM put more traps out so they can help detect this early. And uh, that could really make a lot of difference. Uh, Finger Lakes PRISM has also been involved in outreach like we have at Cornell Extension. Uh, and you may have seen some of these signs, magnets. They even have um, little um, flyers that go on wine bottles for all the tourists in the region. And are they're using social media as well. And this is a newer thing that I thought was interesting. So there's a couple that uh, are artists that uh, live in the Finger Lakes. I think their farm where they do uh, sculpture work overlooks Cuca Lake. And they develop this kind of a puzzle that you put together. And um, Finger Lakes Prism has worked with them. They've gotten this out to uh, students in the area. And uh, you can also purchase it online and uh, build your own spotted lanternfly. But it's a useful outreach uh, tool anyway. And it, uh, it's being purchased nationally. And it was developed right here in the Finger Lakes. So this is one reason that we're really concerned about um, spotted lanternfly. As I mentioned, late in the season, it really likes to go to grapes. And we have a big wine industry throughout New York State. You know, we're located here in the Finger Lakes, and we're familiar with all the wineries there. Um, there's also a pretty uh, important uh, grape vineyard wine industry right along the Hudson River in the Hudson Valley, a newer one in Long Island, but some big estates um, and some nice newer wineries there. And then if we go to Western New York, this is where a good portion of the world's grape juice is grown. This extends into Pennsylvania. So they, they grow a lot of Concord grapes right in there. In fact, their acreage surpasses all of the wine grapes that are grown. So all of these areas are important to New York agriculture. You can see by the statistics I have there that it um, is very important economically for us. And there it is. There's spotted lanternfly on a grape uh, vine at the end of the season when they like to come in right around harvest time. And they'll be there after harvest as well. Um, they're not feeding on the grapes. They're not feeding on the leaves. As I mentioned, they're feeding on the vines themselves, tapping into that xylem and phloem and uh, removing sugars from the vines. And that weakens them. Um, and they can be so weak that they don't survive the winter. And sadly, that's what's happened here. This is a picture of a dead vineyard, 35 acres that was lost in Pennsylvania due to spotted lanternfly feeding. So we don't want that to happen in New York. And I think we are prepared. Our growers will know what to do if it does uh, arrive here. And it, it sadly is already in the Hudson Valley. The first spotted lanternfly to be found in New York State in a vineyard happened in um, last fall in the Hudson Valley. Uh, just another picture of uh, the devastation that this insect can cause due to its feeding. Um, and here is a shot of um, a vine. And at the base there, those are not grapes, those are dead spotted lanternfly after they 
made an insecticide treatment there. And sadly, you can get almost complete control and then five or 10 days later, you can have just as many spotted lanternfly because these things like to move around. They'll be in the hedgerows in the trees there and keep coming back into the vineyards. Uh, and there it was October um, in Orange County, New York was that first spotted lanternfly. So we are monitoring this pretty closely statewide. Um, and now the, the uh, growers there know what to do. And a colleague of mine at Penn State sent me this picture. Um, in some of the areas where they had a lot of spotted lanternfly in their vineyards, the populations went down after a couple of years, and they were hoping that that would be consistent. And sometimes that happens with invasive species. They go, their populations are really high, and then some natural predators uh, figure out that they can feed on them, and then they go down. But in this case, we had a rebound. And just look at all of those spotted lanternfly on that grapevine. So that that's one where the grower definitely needs to control that or that vine may not survive. Um, I hesitate to show the picture on the right because um, it is accurate. They will feed on apple trees, but they don't stay long. So we're not seeing an, uh, any impact to the apple tree health and the fruit seems to be just fine. Now, if these were young apple trees, that could be an issue, but um, it's not a big problem as that picture would indicate like, oh no, we have to watch our apples too. We're gonna watch them, but um, it's not a, as big a threat as it is to our grape industry. And these pictures came to me last year from uh, Staten Island where they have an urban farm. And we had heard from the um, growers and individuals in Pennsylvania that they can be on cucumbers. And that's what we're seeing here. And we haven't talked about the different life stages, but these are the immature stages of spotted lanternfly. And this would be just about a month from now in early July. You could see something like this with the spotted lanternfly along the uh, grapevines. And then this is okra that they're growing. And they had a solution for this. And that was um, because in an urban farm setting, it's really difficult to use a pesticide. Um, they used a handheld vacuum. And I got a little video to show you of that. It worked pretty well for them. All right, so let's talk about where spotted lanternfly is right now, what it would look like and what happens through the year. So we just got word uh, last week, I think it was Friday that, um, the population in Oswego hatched, and we we're starting starting to see those first instars. And they're then when they hatch, they almost look like ticks, and they're black, but they have these white spots. Uh, all of these white spots that ticks do not have. Um, and then they shed their skin and get larger and larger through the growing season. And then July, uh, you see these red colored uh, insects and at this stage they're only crawling they can't fly and then they develop in to the adults that we're so familiar with with the spots they have orange underwings that they can sometimes show and you'll see in the next slide and uh, and then they start to lay their eggs in that September time frame covering <laughs> the eggs up and unfortunately the eggs can survive sub-zero temperatures so that's not going to kill them for us in upstate New York, but they do have, they take a long time to they, until they get to the stage where they can lay eggs, and so that could help us. So here they are again through the year. So we're right at this uh, time frame where they've hatched and they're just these small black insects. They'll be getting a little larger and then it can be a pretty long time when they're adults from generally the August uh, time frame through December we'll see them um, mm. if we don't have a killing freeze. So they could, it's potential if we have a very cold fall that they'll be shut down at some point in October, but lately, uh, and especially, you know, along the Finger Lakes where the lake water moderates our temperatures a little bit, uh, they'll probably be there at least through uh, a good part of November because it really takes a cold freeze in the 20s to knock them out. 
Here you can see them laying their eggs. And these are the individual eggs all lined up. Any one egg mass might have 30 to 50 eggs in it. And then it's covered with this uh, putty-like material. And you can see this female didn't get all of her eggs covered. They can still hatch even though they're not covered, but they're more vulnerable to uh, predators in that way. Scavenger insects. And here's where we get really concerned because they can lay their eggs on anything. This is a camp chair with egg masses on them. Each of these egg masses, like I said, have 30 to 50 eggs in them. This was uh, leaned up against the tree for this photo, but they were laid on the underside. And if that chair was taken to any part of the country, any part of New York State that doesn't have spider lanternfly, and it was left outside in the spring, these egg matches, egg masses would hatch in May, and you could have a new infestation starting that way. So this is another reason not to move firewood and to expect uh, inspect equipment. They can lay, you know, here it is on rusty metal. Can lay under wheel wells, as I mentioned, probably um, uh, uh, train cars and those kinds of things as well. This is a picture just from the winter. Um, there they are. That is um, a weed, a Japanese knotweed, that they laid an egg mass on there. And I happened to be in Pennsylvania in the spring to catch uh, egg mass, uh, an egg mass that was hatching. So you can see the young ones. When they first come out, they're gray, and then pretty quickly they develop the blackish uh, pigment that you see right there. And it's just a little video of them uh, moving around there in that egg nest. And I got this picture last week from Owego, where um, in, this is in upstate New York, where they just noticed the first ones that were hatching there. And it's this fourth instar that's really interesting. So they're black and white and um, you know, they're small. This one has a little bit larger size, almost three quarters of an inch. And then a slit will develop on the backside of this insect in July, generally mid to late July, sometimes early August. And that's when the adult uh, spider lanternfly um, emerges. The wings elongate and we have something that looks like this. And they are about a, an inch long. And uh, sometimes they'll show their orange underwings and uh, they can be very noticeable that way. And you can see these dark black uh, dots. So, you know, a polka dotted insect, how hard could that be to locate? Well, uh, sometimes when it's on a tree trunk, it is. Take a look at this trunk. I took this picture in Pennsylvania. This is on a red maple. Can you see the spotted lanternfly there? Okay. I, see the this, I heard somebody saying they, they're seeing one. Just I, I barely. Put, just barely, right? Yeah, and so you could drive by that, but uh, here there are four of them that uh, I picked up there. And sometimes, you know, if I'm driving slowly by an area and I'm looking for them, what I notice first is not their coloration, but it is something sticking out from the side of the trunk if I'm viewing it in that way. So, um, yeah, you have to look closely. And the first uh, species we might see it on in our area is likely when the population is very low, is that Alanthus, that tree of heaven. Uh, so you might want to become familiar with that or familiar with where that is in your area. If it's in a park, if it's in a parking lot, go there first because that's likely the first place it will be found. And uh, if you do find it, we don't, we want you to report it. Now in New York City and Lower Hudson Valley, they don't need to report anymore. It is everywhere there. In upstate New York, it's complete opposite. We really want those reports to come in. Uh, there's a quick URL report, SLF, report spotted lanternfly, uh, com, and that will take you to a reporting link that goes directly to Ag and Markets. You can upload your photo. And this insect is pretty easy to recognize by a photo. Um, and you put in your location, contact information, 
that'll go right to ag and markets. If they see something that pops up from the Finger Lakes region, it um, they'll be getting back to you pretty shortly. So um, how does this feed? Let's take a look. This is a spider lanternfly that's flipped over on its back. And we're taking a look at this part right here. That is how this uh, insect feeds. It inserts this uh, probe bosque, this long uh, straw basically, into the tree trunk, or when it's younger, it into leaf petioles, the leaf stems, and it knows just where to go. It has sensors on the end, so it finds where it should be, and then it pulls out the, um, the fluids. And it excretes something called honeydew, which is a sugary water. It uh, filters out some of the proteins at once and then excretes this uh, honeydew. And uh, I have a little video here of the insects feeding. Again, they're not feeding on the leaves or the fruit, even though one is on there right now. But take a look at uh, what happens here. Hopefully you can see this on your screen, but we're, we're gonna watch this insect here. And in a few seconds, you're gonna see some of that honeydew coming out from the backside. And you can see a little bit dripping down here. Oh, do you see it there? Uh, so sometimes it's first detected when it's up in trees because you're walking under it and it feels like a little bit of a drizzle that's coming down. And that's not rain, that's the tree fluids that are being filtered through the insect and then spilling down. Um, if you have a car parked under a tree that has spider lanternfly feeding, you might see shiny spots on your car. And this is what it can do when at in the end of the season they congregate together um, and they're all over that tree trunk. And then because they're excreting this fluid, it um, puts down a sticky substance that a fungus can grow on, and that fungus is uh, black colored. It's called sooty mold. This is a picture. These uh, two steps have that uh, coating on there, and this one was power washed, so it's no longer there. So you can see what it should look like. And this is um, that honeydew, that sugary material with fungus growing on it. So it can be a nuisance, and really on steps, it could be a little bit of a hazard. In addition to that, uh, because it's a sweet material, bees and yellow jackets also like the honeydew. And they will um, go to their, uh, especially late in the season, rather than going to flowers that, and there's fewer of them at that time of year anyway, and they'll get uh, their nectar, so to speak, from the backside of a spotted lanternfly. And so there could be an increased um, chance of getting stung, especially by the yellow jackets late in the season. And uh, it was certainly a notice over New York City. This was all over a one month period. Here were some of the headlines and we worked with some of the reporters on some of these articles. Um, it uh, really got people's attention because it's a very visible insect. And um, people were really noticing it in New York City, including the New York Post. They have their own spin to everything, right? So they had this sensationalistic headline. Actually, I was out of town and my colleague uh, was quoted in here and actually he was a voice of reason in this otherwise sensationalistic uh, article. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's getting attention. Um, and, you know, Part of it is we were asking people to stomp and squish it because it is an invasive insect and we don't want it around. Um, so in Philadelphia, when it first hit, we had uh, they had to put out the word not to call 911 to report spotted lanternfly because their call centers were getting inundated with reports of spotted lanternfly. And, and, and it can look pretty dramatic when it occurs. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, and this is my brother's house near Harrisburg. And he was noticing spots on his truck of that honeydew in the summer. And then all of a sudden, he saw these uh, it, the trunks of his tree covered with um, a spider lanternfly late in the season. 
Ben, that picture on the right, my sister-in-law posted it on Facebook and she got a lot of advice. Uh, and a lot of this we don't recommend. You can see here, uh, use a blowtorch. No, please don't do that. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, some people are saying they're killing their blue spruce. They actually don't kill blue spruce. Um, and there's some um, recommendations that we don't do there. But my point is, I guess, by sharing this, people feel very strongly about this insect. But we try to remind people that they don't bite. They don't sting. They're not going to stay in the house. You know how we have stink bugs that'll show up and the Asian multi-spotted lady beetles that'll be in our house could be a little bit of a nuisance. These cannot survive uh, for longer than about 48 hours without feeding on a plant. So we just don't see these indoors at all. So there's no need to panic if you see them and our landscape trees, that tree in my brother's front yard is just fine. Uh, trees have the reserves so they can handle a little bit of their sap being extracted and do just fine the following year. Um, so in our uh, IPM program, that part of Cornell, we are putting traps out. Um, we haven't put out as many as the Finger Lakes Prism. We're concentrating mostly on vineyards and that area, the agriculture side of things. But here's just some examples of the traps. This one is the one that's most commonly used and it's called a circle trap. It funnels the insects as they climb up. They have a desire always to climb up tree trunks. And as they do, they get funneled in to this narrow area and end up on, in a bag that's placed at the top or sometimes it's a plastic jar that's there. There's also some sticky traps that can be used. This one has a sticky material on the inside and it's raised up a bit from the trunk. So the insect goes up there and gets caught in there. You don't wanna have the sticky material on the outside because then you could get a uh, bycatch. You could have um, birds and frogs and those kind of things get caught on there. We don't wanna see that. Uh, so we're doing some outreach work, as I mentioned, especially working on the agriculture end of things. And we're collecting some of the egg masses in the winter to rear them indoors uh, in a lab setting. We're also working with the extension offices throughout the state to get information out there. And your local extension offices have heard about this. If you would rather go to them, if you think you found it somewhere, uh, call them or go in. Um, they'd be happy to uh, help you with uh, the spider lantern fly. Uh, any question about that? We also have a listserv. And um, on our website, we have a lot of resources. So if you just put into Google rather than the long URL, um, NYS IPM, and that stands for Integrated Pest Management, uh, Cornell, uh, Spotted Lanterfly, any of that, you'll uh, get routed to our website. And there we have, if it becomes established and you would like to use an insecticide, we have a list of the possible insecticides that you could use that are labeled for this pest. We're also doing outreach to farms, including the farm workers that might be the first to uh, see spotted lanternfly. And here's a bit of good news. We always need a little bit of hope for the future. This is Eric Clifton there in the middle. He has, over the last several years, collected spotted lanternfly. He's gone down to Pennsylvania, collected spotted lanternfly that are dead, that died due to um, fungi that are infecting um, the spotted lanternfly. And the idea is, can we rear these fungi, these fungi in the lab and use those as a natural way, a biological control for uh, spotted lanternfly? So that work is underway in a tightly sealed lab at Cornell to, to help uh, mm -hmm. see if we can find some natural controls for uh, spotted lanternfly. And here are two different fungi that uh, can be effective under the right conditions to control that. And um, Eric also found a brand new fungus 
that um, can infect spotted lanternfly. And this one only, uh, to our knowledge, infects spotted lanternfly. It doesn't infect any other insect. And there are uh, birds that feed on spotted lanternfly. Backyard chickens will, if given the opportunity. Uh, cardinals, catbirds, blue jays, and tufted titmice will do that as well. Um, and uh, through a citizen science project, they looked at what else will feed on spotted lanternfly. And they found um, that uh, there are insects, uh, including praying mantis. There's evidence that the praying mantis population has increased in the areas of Pennsylvania where they have a lot of spotted lanternfly because they have this new food source. Yellow jackets, orb weird or spiders, wheel bugs. You might not be familiar with wheel bugs now, but if spotted lanternfly comes here, their populations have increased some in those areas. So you might um, recognize, uh, might see some more wheel bugs and uh, ants may be feeding on them as well. Um, there are also fish. And some of these, you know, are aquarium fish. So somebody put the spotted lanternfly in their aquarium and saw that their fish ate um, spotted lanternfly. Um, and I think the same is true for some of the, the snakes and frogs and toads. So some of this is happening on its own. Nature is finding a way. And there's also mammals that uh, were recorded in the Citizen Science Project as feeding on them. That includes our dogs and cats. They always don't always keep it down, so they might bring it back up, but there's no evidence that the spotted lanternfly is poisonous. And if you go down to the bottom here, uh, even a toddler will, when they're putting anything in their mouth, uh, somebody must have, must have noticed that uh, a toddler put a spotted lanternfly in their mouth. Again, we don't know of any toxins in spotted lanternfly, but that's being looked at as well. And uh, yeah, I can probably wrap up uh, right about there, but I'm happy to take questions and uh, talk about, you know, some of the things that I showed here and, and your experience. Maybe some of you have been to Pennsylvania where you might have seen this or even downstate New York over the last year or two. Brian, thanks so much. Um, I have a question about something you didn't really cover, and that mm. is just wonder if you could go, you know, tell us a little bit about the quarantine process. I know that parts of uh, Pennsylvania have this, you know, spotted lantern fly quarantine. I just wonder if you could tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, this map shows nationally um, where the quarantines are and you can go online. We have this on our website if you're curious and want to see it a little bit better and a little bit more detail. Um, but the red lines here, you can see it right along the Chesapeake Bay there. There's a lot of red there because of the border of Pennsylvania. Uh, the red lines indicate that that area is under quarantine. So the whole state of New Jersey is under quarantine. Most of Maryland is. Not all of it is. Um, and this does include all of the counties in Pennsylvania that are infested. We don't have the quarantines in New York at this time. We have an external quarantine. So, you know, you're not allowed to bring a product in that has spotted lanternfly, but we don't have an external quarantine. And uh, that is uh, kind of a political process that takes a lot for that to happen. And it affects trade. So uh, permits are required for anybody moving material from these areas. They have to have uh, the trucking company, for example, has to have uh, be permitted and all of the drivers have to be informed about spotted lanternfly so um, they don't hopefully accidentally transport it. So that's just a little bit about uh, the spotted lanternfly quarantine. Some of the newer states don't have it. Ohio actually does have uh, a quarantine there. And with or without the quarantine, I think information is getting out so that, um, it, you know, hopefully it's not being accidentally moved um, by our, our trucking. And, and even, you know, where there is a quarantine, it doesn't mean every train car, for example, has been inspected. 
um, and there is a possibility that it can move even out of a quarantine area. So this is um, like transportation of products that have been um, picked up in these areas, or is it? Does it also include um, trucks and train that are going through this area? Um, it for vehicles that. Um, are going there to pick up a load or originate there. I don't think it covers uh, anything for something that's going through unless it, you know, has a planned stop. And I think this is, these are for roadways. I don't think the rail is covered under these uh, quarantines. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Anyone you know that has a question at this point is welcome to unmute if you'd like. Looks like John might be trying to talk. I don't know if you can unmute him. Oh, John, it looks like you're muted. No, I can't unmute. Okay. Uh, Brian, is there uh, traps that we're setting out in the Finger Lakes area? Is there any kind of a survey program? Yes, there is a survey. Yes, program. there is a survey. Uh oh, getting a little. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Getting a little. A little back there. Okay, I'm here. Okay, there we go. Brian, okay. Brian, this is John. There we go. Brian, this is John McKay uh, from Moorhead, New York. Uh, the question I I missed uh, early part of the program. Uh, where does this originate? Is this another uh, infusion from uh, lumber or equipment being imported from other countries, or was there is there knowledge of where its origin? That's a good question. It, That's a good question. It, oh, okay. Uh, so it is native to Asia. Uh, so it is native to Asia. This is its native range. I'm not sure why okay. we're this is its Okay. Yeah. So there's its native range. And it was um, brought in, it's believed, on either the pallet or on landscape stone that was imported to an area just north of Philadelphia. Um, and I didn't know we were importing landscape stone, but I, apparently we were. And so it came over in a shipment, like I said, either on the pallet, uh, on the wood that uh, laid its eggs there in the fall in this area. And then uh, when that material was there in Pennsylvania, north of Philadelphia in the spring, the eggs hatched and it was probably unrecognized. No one was looking for this insect. Um, for maybe a year or two, and then suddenly uh, somebody found this brand new insect. And it's really new to science because in Asia, it's not um, a problem. It's There's probably enough natural predators and nat enough natural fungi and bacteria that keep it in check that uh, it's really there in low population. So we've had some scientists go over to its native range and uh, try to bring back maybe some predators that could keep it in check, but uh, they have trouble finding it. So because of that, it wasn't well studied. So we're playing catch up and learning a lot about this insect in a short period of time. We didn't know, uh, for example, until a couple of years ago, if it had to have um, the tree of heaven to complete its life cycle. We found out that it's possible for it to not, but most of them are going to find that at some point in its life. A little bit about its background, but take any other questions. Might come up. Comments. Hey, Lynn, you're on mute. Here I am talking about someone else being muted and <laughs> muted. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, on uh, in reference to the uh, pallets uh, being imported to this country, uh, I worked in the sector where there was uh, 
the requirements of uh, exporting uh, equipment to uh, China and to Southeast Asia. And their demands were that all pallets were put into a kiln where it was raised to like 200 degrees temperature to kill any kind of insects that were being shipped through the pallet. So I don't know if our government has addressed this issue, but I'm sure that uh, that's how a lot of these uh, invasive insects get into our country. And I'm surprised that we don't monitor it a little more closely, but uh, it's very, uh, I live in a great country here and everyone's very concerned because it could be a very, very uh, big problem for the industry. So thank you so much for listening to me, Ben. Uh, I appreciate uh, the input. Yes. That's, it. that's yeah. all I have. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's an important point. And I, you know, this probably came into the US about uh, 10 years ago, it was first recognized in 2014. I think our standards are higher and they're really looking at those pallets to make sure that they're not bringing in pathogens. Um, and I think they're, from what I hear, the regulations these days over the last five years are really being followed and they're not bringing in fresh wood that uh, may carry pathogens or pests like this. But um, as far as the inspection process is going, you know, it's a global economy and I, it's less than 1% of the pallets or the containers that are really uh, looked at closely. But uh, there are very good inspectors that are at all the ports and, and they're doing their job and, um, you know, trying to identify this. And they have ways to uh, sample from that to see what might emerge from um wood that looks a little bit suspicious so i think we've stepped up our game a little bit after spotted land fly came in jim did you have a question about uh, monitoring programs yeah i know uh larry in our group has been uh doing it dan also <clears throat> is there anything um, going on this year that we should be trying to get involved with uh, Yes, yeah, through that Finger Lakes uh, PRISM group, mm -hmm. um, you can uh, get a trap and put it out in your location. And uh, I think they would be happy to work with you on that. Do you know, Caitlin, do you have the connection to the, the Finger Lakes PRISM? Yeah, so yes. we are in close connection or communication with Matt Gallo, who's their terrestrial invasive species coordinator. So he'll be running that program. Um, and yeah, if anyone is interested in doing that, you know, the the map here shows only three locations in the Seneca Lake watershed having had traps maybe last year's program. So we are hoping to see a little bit more. Um, I don't know the details about the program and how often those traps are monitored, but it would be good to have uh, a bit more uh, or a few more traps around Seneca Lake this year. Brian, the traps themselves, are they meant to trap the adult stage uh, spotted lanternfly only, or do you find that they are able to trap the immature um, stage as well? They do a great job at uh, catching all of the life stages. Okay. So we definitely see the nymphs, those early instars being caught in the traps. They're climbing up just like the adults will. And so, yeah, all of them. And I don't know if I mentioned, but there is no pheromone. There's no uh, scent that draws them in right now. I mean, this is something that's being researched. So um, we're just looking at putting them in a tree. They like to climb high. So they'll look for like the tallest tree in the area, or if it's an Alanthus tree, that's a good, uh, or tree of heaven, um, that's a, a good uh, tree to put it on. But like I said, they can feed on a, over a hundred different species. Um, so we're just hoping that if it's there, it's being caught. And it's kind of good because, you know, if you're putting it up near a winery, and they might be concerned, oh, you're going to be drawing them into this area. No, uh, we don't have an attractant uh, for this insect at this point. So it's if if it's there, hopefully it'll be going up in that trap and we'll be detecting it. 
would you be willing to tell us which uh, why, which vineyards you currently have traps at? And have you seen, are they mainly in this, like the Southern portion of the Finger Lakes at this point? Um, we, I work with the grape specialist throughout New York state. And so um, I supply these to uh, the grape specialist and then they put them out um, in the um, near the vineyards that are there and i honestly don't know which ones they're at but uh it, we do have some near geneva for sure okay all right any other questions tonight for brian okay all right. Well, thanks for your attention. Yeah, Good absolutely. Day. Thanks for joining us tonight. And um, everybody, hopefully we can all uh, join in on one of the volunteer opportunities between Seneca Pier Waters and Finger Lakes Prism. There's a lot of great things going on um, to help protect Seneca Lake and, of course, the watershed. Um, and uh, Brian, thank you so much. Um, this recording again, it'll be available to everyone. And Brian, I'll send it your way uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thanks, Have Brian. A yeah. Thanks.